Welcome. I'm Leslie Hewitt, Associate Professor of Art here at the Cooper Union. Thank you all for joining us. Let me begin by saying how delighted we are to host this panel discussion as part of our continuing series of public art fun virtual talks at the Cooper Union. As many of you probably know, these talks are organized around New York City, New York City exhibitions that connect the social, socially transformative power of art to a wide public audience. This panel accompanies a fascinating new exhibition titled Black Atlantic, which is currently on display in Br Brooklyn Bridge Park. Black Atlantic brings together commissioned works by five artists inspired by complex hybrid cultures and identities of the diaspora that connects Africa with the Americas and Europe. We are excited to welcome the panel of artists for this afternoon's conversation and to once again collaborate with the Public Art Fund to make this kind of programming possible at the Cooper Union. We're especially fortunate to be able to partner with an organization who shares our commitment to expanding free access to arts and culture. Cooper Union has from its founding more than 163 years ago, worked to advance the idea that the welfare of New York City and society at large is predicated on educational and creative engagement with public life. Today's program is presented in precisely that spirit. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Kelly Honeycutt, who will introduce you to the featured panelists. Henny, uh, excuse me, <laughs> Kelly Honeycutt is Public Art Fund's Deputy Director helping advance the organization's vision. Um, thank you so much for being here, Kelly. Thank you so much, Leslie, for the warm welcome. It's, uh, it's an honor to be introduced by you. Um, and welcome to everyone who's joining us today. Um, before we begin, uh, just a note that closed captioning is available for this talk and you can submit questions at any time using the Q&A button below. Um, I'd like to begin by offering our respect and gratitude to the Lenape people, acknowledging that our New York City offices and projects stand on their homeland of Lenape Hoking, and also to acknowledge the indigenous communities across the globe on whose land we all sit. I'd also like to thank the donors who make these free public talks possible, in particular Con Edison, the New York State Council on the Arts, and the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, as well as Bloomberg Philanthropies, the presenting sponsor of Black Atlantic, and all of the generous donors to this terrific exhibition. Um, and finally, a huge thank you to the Public Art Fund Board, many of whom are joining us this afternoon. Hi, everybody. Um, public Art Fund Talks at the Cooper Union connect compelling contemporary artists to a broad public by establishing a dialogue about artistic practice and public art. And today's talk is really emblematic of that important dialogue. I'm thrilled to invite four of the five artists who created new works for this exhibition to join me on screen now. Uh, welcome Hugh, Layla, Kian, and Dozy, um, as well as our adjunct curator, Daniel S. Palmer. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Leslie and Kelly. Um, as Kelly said, I'm Daniel Palmer. Uh, I'm currently chief curator at SCAD Museum of Art. And uh, previously, as curator at Public Art Fund, I had the honor to work with Hugh and all of the great artists um, that we're talking with today, uh, as well as Tao, who's not able to join us, uh, to organize this incredible exhibition, Black Atlantic that we'll be discussing today. Um, and I hope if they haven't been brought up already um, that the panelists are all able to be seen on the screen as a grid here. Um, and I'll just give very brief introductions to these wonderful, to this wonderful group that we have today. I'll sort of read a kind of brief little one-line bio for each of them. Um, and then we'll get into a discussion about each of their works. They'll each be sharing about their work. Um, and we'll have a bit of time for discussion after and questions and answers from the audience. So if you have a, a question, please feel free to put it in the, uh, the Q&A um, button down below and we'll get to all those. Um, so briefly, I'll say Leila um, Babire is an artist and activist originally from Kampala, Uganda, who lives and works in Brooklyn, New York. 
Throughout her multidisciplinary practice, uh, Babire transforms wood, ceramic, found materials, and paint into figurative sculptures that address issues surrounding identity, sexuality, and human rights. Hugh Hayden considers the anthropomorphizing of the natural world as a visceral lens to explore the human condition. Utilizing wood as his primary medium, Hayden transforms familiar objects through a process of selection, carving, and juxtaposition to challenge our perceptions of ourselves, others, and the environment. Dozy, Dozy Canoe, is based in Santarim, Portugal. His research focuses on a concept of sculpture that looks at the production of objects in which a tension between their, uh, their use and their history, memory, and materiality is embedded. Canoe's visual language criticizes Western art history canons, subtly and elegantly revealing the object's narratives involving colonialism and identity, focusing on their diasporic condition. And uh, Keon Williams is a visual artist and writer who works fluidly across performance, sculpture, video, and 2D realms. Rooted in a process-driven practice, they are attracted to quotidian unconventional materials and methods that evoke the historical, political, and ecological forces that shape individuals and collective bodies. And um, as I said before, the final artist in the exhibition, Tao Lewis, um, unfortunately is not able to join today, but I will give a bit of information about, um, about uh, Tao's contribution to the exhibition after the other artists speak. So, um, each of the artists will speak. Um, we'll do it in alphabetical order with the one sort of uh, alteration to that being that we'll lead off with Hugh. Um, since Hugh, I had the honor of also being um, my co-curator in this exhibition um, and really was uh, one of the conceptual driving forces of this and is a tireless advocate for all of these great artists um, that are included in the show. Um, but why don't I just start off with maybe a kind of brief background about the exhibition which um, and public art fund, which is to say, um, to talk about Black Atlantic is to talk about, I think for me, the, the dialogue that Hugh and I have had for over 10 years. Um, I first met Hugh when Hugh was an artist in residence at Abrams Art Center, um, which was I think like 2012, 2013 around then. And um, we, I think really hit it off. We, I was really, I just found his work absolutely fascinating and we wanted to figure out, you know, various opportunities to work together. And it really was uh, probably about like four years ago now that Hugh and I started working um, you know, to, to really do something with Public Art Fund, you know, to, to showcase his work at Brooklyn Bridge Park. Um, and, you know, I have to say for Hugh to have taken that incredible platform of doing an exhibition of public art at that site, um, and to say that he wanted to expand that platform to have the dialogue of, of his work in, you know, in conversation with um, not just the post-industrial waterfront of, of Brooklyn Bridge Park, but also to expand that platform to showcase this incredible group of emerging artists, to have a, exhi a group exhibition of five artists, you know, was something that, frankly, I think really in a meaningful way pushed the conversation, pushed the kinds of things that Public Art Fund could do that had been done at the park, that, that site has never had a group exhibition, you know, uh, like this before, um, and allowed all of these really incredible, really important voices um, to address the transatlantic histories of that site, to address the Atlantic Ocean, the waterfront, also to address um, diaspora and to showcase the complex hybrid identities um, that are a part of um, this moment and really which are, are incredibly um, present in all of their work. So why don't I hand it over now to Hugh at this point to give a bit of an introduction um, to the, the show more generally, the various themes of the show, what it was like to kind of put the show together. Um, and then we'll go, each, we'll go through each of the other artists with slides where they can talk about their work. We'll, go, we'll have Hugh talk first, then Layla, then Dozy, and Keon. Um, and I'll just sort of bring up the reader to talk about uh, Tao's work at the very end. Over to you, Hugh. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Dan, for that introduction. Uh, thank you to the Public Art Fund and Brooklyn Bridge Park for hosting this exhibition, and as well as all the other artists who, who like so graciously contributed, you know, their talents, their works, their skills, and really showed up uh, for this exhibition. 
Um, as Dan was saying, um, we first started uh, collab talking or uh, about collaborating on a project at Brooklyn Bridge Park um, in 2018. And the, the project has evolved, but it's still very similar to uh, what we always, I guess, the original idea that um, this site being on the water, um, uh, you know, and uh, uh, sort of, you know, the waterfront that it that it could have this dialogue as a public um, art uh, site um, with the water and the history of the water as a way as a launching point for an, the idea of what an exhibition could be and thinking about the park as a like outdoor museum of uh, where each of the different lawns are, are sort of get different galleries. Um, you know, I, I immediately thought, you know, to do an exhibition on this site that it would be about that it would engage with sort of the history and dialogue of, uh, of Africa, um, with the African diaspora around the Atlantic Ocean and the United States. But beyond that, also dealing with the Caribbean, as well as uh, Europe. And uh, so, and that also that my voice alone, I didn't want to seem like I would be speaking for, uh, you know, a whole di diaspora that, 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 that an, a, an exhibition would really need to have take on multiple voices to really have an expansive and sort of diverse way of approaching this subject. And so, you know, that became uh, the, the exhibition becoming a group exhibition um, with these wonderful artists, but, uh, you know, I'm, and even though it was about the work and artists who are sculptors who really engage uh, with the handmade or the exploration of materials, um, I think one of the important things about sculpture is that it is something you experience in real life that isn't can't truly be translated in a digital format. And I think all of the artists in the exhibition really sort of, you know, harness their understanding of, of materials to reflect their own personal histories. Um, and also create something new and expansive to create like a new, to sort of really, you know, explore their own identity and their own view of the world. Um, myself, you know, I was, I'm really interested in sort of the anthropomorphization of the natural environment and, and sort of, you know, looking um, at how sort of, you know, trees and wood can be uh, explored and enhanced to sort of, uh, uh, reflect our own sort of connections to society uh, or to landscapes, both social and natural. And so I I chose to look at a boat as a vessel. Um, I don't know if there are slides up simultaneously of, our, of my artwork, but um, the idea that, uh, you know, obviously the, the African diaspora and the ocean, a, a boat uh, plays a, a huge role in, in that conversation. And that sort of also is looking at Winslow Homer's uh, and Carrie James Marshall's paintings called the Gulf Stream as a somewhat of a source of inspiration or, or either kind of came through after I was developing the idea, but this idea of the boat as this vessel that is, is sort of tr transporting people or things or goods and but also thinking of it in this way that boat is like actually very similar you know, to like a well or sort of, you know, uh, in terms of size and and giving it, replacing the structure of a boat with this sort of well skeleton created this surreal object that is both this creature simultaneously, though it, it's still a boat, it's a vessel. And as you see it from a distance, it might not be, you might, might not be as aware that it is a boat, but as you get up closer, it transforms to it is a, there's something else inside. And I really like that as a sculpture that while it's static, it could be two things at once and that it transforms as a viewer approaches it, that it, it can be more than just one thing. Um, but also it's likewise, the sort of ways of interpreting it, it's not just about the African diaspora, which it could be looked at through one viewpoint, thinking about the Gulf Stream as a sort of current or even this and from our historical narrative, what the, the Gulf Stream meant as this sort of vessel that was transporting people. It also can take on different narratives like Jonah and the well or the river sticks, this idea of uh, a passage to the afterlife. There are many like narratives that um, you know revolve around the water, boats and vessels and, and sort of the artwork being in a public park 
many of the people who engage with this artwork aren't expecting, aren't, aren't paying, or they're not going to a museum, that um, it can really reach a large audience who's not necessarily coming, approaching the artwork from a particular viewpoint and that they might connect to it just on their connection, you know, wow, the boat or the skeleton like structure on the inside. And that, you know, there's the opportunity for them to read more about the artwork, all the artworks and sort of expand their perspective. And so as an artist, I'm really interested in this idea of, you know, one, I myself having this sort of my own viewpoint of the world and that my artwork is a remixture it's a remixing of histories and my perspective to create something new that might challenge people's perspectives and that while it might seem you know honky dory and accessible in a really expansive way at first as the viewer sort of engages more with the work and finds out about it they might be able to challenge ideas they you know the, their perspectives they had about things I guess we'll move on to Layla. Mute myself again. <clears throat> Am I on? Yes. All right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Public Art Fund and everybody that is watching right now. And uh, thank you very much, Hugh Hayden, for the opportunity of you thinking of us, other artists, to share the space with you. And <clears throat> thanks, Daniel, and thanks every other person. Um, so I'm going, for the first time, I'm going to read a little bit on why I created this piece when I was given this opportunity. First, um, I'm gonna say thanks to you, Hugh, for the introduction of the, the title, you and uh, Daniel, uh, the Black Atlantic Project, that has enabled me to educate myself more about slavery and about a distinct Black Atlantic culture that in incorporates elements of Africans, Americans, British and Caribbean cultures. And this I read from uh, Paul, Griroy, hope I pronounced it right. Uh, this, when I was told, when I was commissioned or asked to do a public art fund piece about the Black Atlantic, for the first time it took me back as a scholar, as an artist, uh, to read and find out what Black Atlantic is, because where basically I come from in East Africa, I come from a East Africa which is. Um, uh, a locked country, but we still share borders with uh, Kenya. And uh, most slave, we also have a slavery trade from Mombasa, where we normally get all our goods from. So it brought me back to kind of think about slavery and African Americans. It, it took me in a wide way of reading about the history of African Americans and the slavery part of it that I'd never thought that I would read about and I found so interesting. But when I was looking at it, I didn't look at um, the aspect of slavery and the suffering and the pain. I did not want to look at it, that uh, slavery trend in that manner, but I wanted to look at the positive uh, positivity that got uh, slavery out uh, uh, slaves out of slavery. Uh, in other words, when I was looking at that, I came up with the title of togetherness and I gave it a, a, a traditional name from where I come from, um, uh, which is called Agadi Awam. In other words, this was picked from the spirits of our ancestors from the West Africa and some parts of East African shores of Mombasa. Just parts of East Africa, God me realize the strength of togetherness and every way of uh, togetherness among the slaves that they used <clears throat> in strengthening themselves and liberating themselves through songs and traditional and the tradition they carried. <clears throat> so that's what I basically looked at. And I looked at uh, people that cannot be forgotten in the history like Queen, Queen, Queen Zinga 
Anatuna Ali bin Mohammed, Zanji and Elizabeth Friedman. So it kind of took me for the first time to read. But when I was looking at that, I looked at basically what African-Americans have pos positively picked through their history as they try to seek and look for who they were or where they belong to. And that got me to the, all the ornaments that you see on my works. As usual, I always use uh, fun material to kind of create jewelry on my work and that I reference it with the African-American celebrities who are practicing at the African traditional, spiritually, and also uh, physically and ornaments. We see a lot of people like uh, Jennifer Pence, um, Chaka Khan, uh, we look at basically the musicians mostly who kind of feel like they're still entitled to own the African traditions. So that's what I looked at. And it was basically about the, the, the togetherness that really liberated them through slavery. That's what uh, came into my mind when I was creating a body of work. Am I there? Yes, you're here. <laughs> Am I talking a lot for the first time? <laughs> <laughs> Am I making any sense? <laughs> yes. Yes, Layla, it's okay. perfect. It's perfect. Thank yeah, you. so actually that's what I can talk about my work. For the that's first time wonderful. I had to read something. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, is there anything else you'd like to say about your work at this point? Or do you want to us to pass it over to Dozy and then we can talk after in more of a group? Um, basically, I would like you to pass it over, but I just wanted to uh, hit on a little bit on what uh, intra, uh, what 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 I what uh, got me interested and in, uh, looking at the African uh, African American history, uh, basically the slavery part of it. That's, yes, that's wonderful. What I want. Yeah, thank yes, you very thank much. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you. You're welcome. Great. Happy to then pass over to Dozy. Take it away, Dozy. Hi. Hello, everyone. Um, I definitely want to start by thanking Hugh and Daniel um, for inviting me to this special project. Um, definitely another kind of benchmark moment, it feels like, for me um, at this stage. Um, I guess talking about this work titled On Elbows, um, I guess first I'll talk about what my like kind of like very, very early intentions were, which was I wanted to, to create something that, um, that I felt like it would be really difficult for people to easily just walk past. Um, I don't know why, but I just kind of felt like that is something that maybe most public art should try and achieve, um, is try to like really try to engage with the public as much as it possibly can. Um, so I guess that's where the kind of pulsating vessel came into play. But in regards to the Chai's lounge chair, um, it kind of felt appropriate for me um, to sort of harken back to um, one of the first works that I actually created uh, within the context of, a, of an organized sort of art exhibition, um, which was in 2017 um, at an at a venue, uh, it was Lever House, um, at a, and it was a, a group exhibition that I was invited to. Uh, I was 22 years old. It was my first time really participating in an art exhibition. And I was amongst a lot of, um, I guess I would say, very established artists. <laughs> um, and within that, uh, within that show, I, I created a bench that was uh, sort of hovering 
and uh, the base of this bench was um, these wheel rims that in my hometown of Houston, Texas, we call elbows or swangas. Um, and I, I decided to take that position within that particular exhibition as a way uh, to kind of, I guess maybe invite my adolescent self to feel comfortable um, within a space that I felt very uncomfortable within. So using the symbol of the 84s as a sort of like gateway in a way. Um, and it, it, it felt appropriate um, to hearken back to that for this project um, because it is a public work and it does actually have more of a chance uh, or would have had more of a chance um, of, I guess, pulling in my adolescent self or piquing my curiosity if I were to have walked by it on a random day walking through the park. Um, so to, to take that same motif of trying to pull my younger self in to a work made sense, but also I guess the Chai's Lounge chair goes into um, where I feel like I'm currently at uh, sort of battling with this kind of uncertainty that I continuously feel and like me trying to work my way past this uncertainty, this, this kind of like maybe, um, I don't know, it's maybe the, the word is uh, unworthiness to like, I sometimes feel like uh, I'm constantly having to try and prove why I should be able to sort of like work in this mode and I, it's like kind of like a psychological barrier that, that I'm trying to get past. And like that can go into a lot of different conversations about the idea of, you know, not, not only being black in America, but being African, like being first generation African in America. Um, the sort of like heavy burdens that I felt of, you know, being the, the one to, to lift the family out of poverty and um, this idea of making work that's meant to be contemplated um, when in fact, a lot of my relatives back home in Nigeria would find that very odd and uh, confusing because the way that they make typically within the African tradition of, of making, you know, everything sort of served a specific purpose, even the figures, the bowls, things that people call sculpture um, in the Western world is actually, uh, there are actually functional objects in another context. So like, I guess I'm always trying to uh, negotiate these complex things that I've just sort of like found myself within. And uh, I don't know, I feel like this piece is a symbol of, of, of that in some way. Um, I guess that's, that's where I could leave it. Thank you so much, Dozy. Uh, yeah. And Kian, we'd love to hear from you, please. Um, hello, friends. It's such a joy <clears throat> to um, gather again with you all um, on the occasion of such an exciting exhibition. Thank you, Dan and you, for the invitation um, for me to um, create um, a new work, uh, the largest that I've made to date, and to be uh, a part of what I think is like a really special and um, a really special exhibition, like materially and conceptually. Um, so my contribution to Black Atlantic is titled Ruins of Empire, which is a 13 foot sculpture made primarily of earth and architectural debris with um, a wood and steel armature. The sculpture is, um, is a one-to-one -one, um, recreation or reimagining of the Statue of Freedom, which is a classic 
bronze monument atop the U.S. Capitol building that was erected in 1863. And when I was invited to participate in this show, um, the first question I asked myself was, um, what is, or like, of the many, um, what is like one sort of contribution that um, that people of African descent, both within the U.S. and without the U.S., have sort of contributed to um, sort of a, a global um, community or to the world. Um, and the first thing that came to mind was um, how uh, both Black folks in America and the Caribbean have really reimagined and reconstructed um, a notion of freedom, what it means to be free, who gets to access freedom um, through movements of, you know, various historical movements of abolition and um, <clears throat> movements for justice. And so I wanted to, well, I thought to appropriate um, a monument that uh, represents a sort of um, represents a certain notion of freedom that was again constructed at a time in 1863 when many people just didn't have access to this very particular notion of freedom. Um, and I thought to reimagine it as a ruin um, as a representation of the sort of shifting and transforming ideas, um, you know, within our contemporary moment. Um, I often work with earth um, as a primary material to um, consider our relationship to the land um, through various political, social, historical, contact or context. Um, and so for me, um, recreating uh, a bronze monument um, as this kind of earth and ruin uh, sort of highlights sort of notions of decay and or as an allegory for um, for uh, notions of social transformation that I think we're experiencing. Um, and I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kian. Um, and I'll just very briefly talk one, two quick lines about um, Tao Lewis's work since Tao was unable, uh, unfortunately, to be able to join the talk today. Um, so Tao for Black Atlantic has created three six foot diameter cast iron sculptures. Um, and in particular, they're inspired by her years of fascination with crinoids. Now, crinoids is not something I actually will admit I necessarily knew about before I dialogue with Tao. But what we all do kind of know usually are um, some examples from the crinoid family, which are starfish, sea urchins, sea cucumbers, and things like that. What Tao informed me, and I think a lot of us about, is that they're also, they have, the crinoid family actually is a prehistoric uh, entity. It really, the prehistoric ancestors of starfish, you know, date back um, to ancient ancient times um, under, under the water, under the sea. Um, and these animals have a kind of stacked disc, um, these, these uh, yeah, creatures ha have a stacked disc, um, which then sort of, it, it, sorry, a stacked column, which has disc-like um, segments that have unique designs on them and each have five pointed symmetry, hence the sort of starfish form that we, um, that we know as one of the manifestations of the crinoids. So Tao sort of took that as a starting point to create these large, beautiful disc sculptures um, and, uh, and cast them in iron after creating these five-pointed symmetry patterns um, that have repeated patterns which incorporate West African uh, adinkira, uh, adinkira uh, symbols 
Um, and they sort of, you can kind of see, she's coated them um, with various different sealants in some areas um, and allowing them to kind of um, rust and how to develop a natural patina in others. So they really sort of take on this beautiful, almost kind of topographic um, dimension to them. Uh, and, and these patterns really show out almost as if um, kind of painting in, in cast form. Um, uh, and, and one of the things that, um, Tao said about these, which is a quote I can read, is um, that the, the castings, quote, ruminate on the wanderings of these ancient animals, the global dispersal of their fossilized bodies, and the coexistence with black bodies above and below the Atlantic and throughout the diaspora. I think that's a really beautiful poetic um, meditation on the form. And you can see with these incredibly nuanced and poetic titles, Tao was just thinking about how to um, not only create something that would just be formally incredibly um, wonderful for this site and for this exhibition, but really to, to speak um, you know, at length to the themes and the ideas of um, the exhibition, Black Atlantic. Um, wonderful. So now let's put away the slides and let's bring all of the artists back onto the screen um, and let's all unmute so we can have, you know, in the last maybe 15 or so minutes, we can have a conversation um, where we can hear from all of the great artists in the show. Uh, and then please, I'll, I'll sort of give another encouragement at this point. If you're in the audience and you have something, you know, you'd like to ask or, or hear more about from um, either a specific uh, one of the artists um, or the artists as a whole, um, please put it in the Q&A um, button in the bottom uh, of your screen. And I'll moderate, uh, I'll get to those questions. But maybe I'll start off um, with one that um, I've just been sort of thinking a lot as we've been you know, working to install the exhibition and share the exhibition that I'll sort of put to each of you, um, which is to get a sense to sort of put the question to you about like, what has it been like to see the work on view? I mean, you know, we worked on this for so long. We, you all gave so much of your time and, you know, brilliant intellect, but also kind of emotional, you know, you, you gave everything to this project. It's really an enormous feat to, to, um, to create a work in public space. And I've just been so impressed with the, the poise and the, and the thoughtfulness that you've all brought to the dialogue. But now that it's up there in the world, you know, what has it meant to you um, to sort of see it in view? And maybe a part of that question is also like asking about a little bit about the public response. You've also started to get to see other people who are outside our kind of circle or outside the circle of people who know your work. Um, what's that meant or, or been like for each of you? And I'm happy to have whoever want, has something they want to share just kind of jump in. I don't necessarily need to uh, play traffic, uh, traffic director on this front. Well, for me in particular, I think um, seeing the way children are reacting to the sculpture has been extremely satisfying I mean maybe it's because of the height of the vessel mm -hmm. and the sort of like you know surrealness of it but you know I remember I just spent like a like a couple hours uh around my sculpture just watching people uh, engage with it and the fact that every single child that interacted with it had questions for their parents was something that I was I was kind of like, okay, like, I feel like I did something, something here because like, I, I think, you know, the idea of curiosity is what brought me to even being an artist in a lot of ways. So to, to, to I guess, um, ignite some curiosity, um, I think is, is really important and, and powerful from my perspective, at least. Yeah. Yeah, I would go on that too. It, it's it's always exciting seeing how people, you know, especially because it's a park and not a museum as well, that how the public engages with the artwork. Sometimes it's, you know, from a fabrication perspective, it's in a really unexpected way in terms of, you know, uh, you know, you can never predict what someone might do or and like, whereas like I might never think of like getting on the the sculpture is like a seat, but yeah, some people yeah. instantly like see it and I gotta jump, I gotta get on it, I gotta take a picture of myself. Yeah. yeah, I see a lot of that as well. 
which kind of is a, a funny way of addressing the nature of the piece, which is like our current moment of like having to capture these moments, like psych psychologically, like having to to capture these like special moments. And um, yeah. on your your muted i'm also really excited by like you know the way people get to like physically interact with my work especially like you know kids jumping on it or people just like touching it and like wanting to like get a sense of the materiality through physical touch um i find it really exciting um in particular because of the ways i'm engaging with the history of monumentalism where so like right in the sight line of my sculpture is the Statue of Liberty. Um, and, you know, bronze monuments are, you know, typically on really high pedestals and they, um, they are built in such a way that um, where like there isn't supposed to be like a physical relationship to viewers, but they kind of have this like overpowering kind of towering, imposing presence. Um, and so for me, as an object maker, um, I'm always interested in like creating objects that shift that sort of relationship between objects and the viewer. And so the fact that like people get to like physically interact okay. with um, this sculpture that's like on the ground, that's partially buried, um, sort of for me kind of affirms, you know, this sort of new relationship that people get to have with it. I didn't I didn't know that people were able to to jump and, and climb on, on that actually. I didn't know. So that's actually really interesting. Um, it's like it's like I don't know how are you able to make it looks like it's made of mud so it could break easily, but it it's not. It's it is there something that you've done, you cured it in a certain way that that makes it uh, durable? Totally. So um, yeah, I work, I've been like experimenting with this like um, material for a really long time. And I found like a, a binder that like, uh, it's like an organic binder that I use so that when it's cured and dry, um, it like is weather resilient, does it reabsorb water? Um, um, and like, you know, can survive the elements. But, you know, part of my visual language is like making these objects that like, you know, crack and appear to be fragile, but are in fact yeah. really sturdy. Yeah, because I mean, it being in the public, there is a notion that it, it has to withstand a hurricane. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that, that was actually one of the questions somebody, you know, asked, uh, can people stand inside the Gulf Stream, you know, and, and, and can people climb on things? And that's just the reality of public space, you know, and I think you all sort of brought such a such thoughtfulness to, um, to the, to the dialogue that inevitably, you know, results in, in working that way. Um, but I wanted to make sure that I also, Layla, I gave Layla an opportunity, if you want to respond to the idea of, you know, or the question about what has it been like to see the work on view in public space and, and public either interaction with your sculptures or a public response if people are posting pictures of it, you know, and, and how you've kind of, how it's, how it's uh, made you feel about working, you know, you're having your work in this context. Uh, <clears throat> sure, thank you very much again, uh, Daniel, for that, for that question. Uh, I, I feel like, um, my my work and uh, where it is staged, it has really created a lot of interaction with people. And uh, since the the show was uh, put up, uh, opened in public, I went back on Saturday last week with a. Uh, I, I think I posted that with a friend of ours who came from Los Angeles, and uh, I I she wanted to see the shows, so I went with her. She had not she had not come. So I was waiting for her. I'm at the park seated right next to my sculptures. And I see uh, people taking photos. And I didn't want to say I'm an artist. Uh, so I wanted to see how people really interact with the work. And it's so interesting how people kind of 
look side to side and touch to, to feel the, the, the material, just to, to see what it is. And uh, I think it's two gay guys who came in and they phoned me there, they were taking photos and they're like, oh, we're here to see the show. I didn't tell them I'm the artist because uh, I felt like, let me let them in interact. And so this friend of mine comes in and, you know, I took her to see the play, the, the work. We started talking about the work and then people are coming in, taking photos. And she screamed and said, oh, she's the artist. Oh my God. I was in, <laughs> I got into it. She, she kind of poured, it was like pouring fire and water. Everybody who was around was like, I don't know how many photos that uh, I had to stand for at that moment. <laughs> so I like how people interact with the work and the questions and how people also get into to touch and feel what is going on. Um, I think you would all uh, know how we kind of, one person went further and kind of touched one of the medals and it fell off. Uh, I still also expect all that to happen. People wanna take souvenirs. So um, I'm open to whatever discussion people bring into the work. They want to take a nail, let them take it because it's, who knows, they're from somewhere, Portugal, you know, they're from somewhere, uh, in China, India, they're, it's all over the world, you know, it's, uh, it's in a public space and it's summertime. So I like how people engage with the work and I've seen a lot of photos on, on, on our Facebook, on Instagram. So I think that's, that's all we need as artists. It's our work to be out there and being interacted with. That's beautiful. Thank you I for sharing that's how that. I can to that. And, and you can't really do that with a painting. Yeah. yeah. No. And and <laughs> when when an artwork is inside a museum, you know, it's true. I mean, maybe as a, a sort of follow up question for for all of you, um, you know, the sort of the durability that's necessitated and the scale that you all rose to to achieve a work in out of doors. Um, you know, uh, so much of, of all of your practice is really about the handmade or about, you know, making things in a kind of really direct and one-to-one -one way. But for this project, you all worked with, um, with fabricators and with a big, you know, installation team to do, you know, to, to do things in the park in this big way. Um, how was that, that process for each of you? And maybe as a kind of secondary question to it that I think is really maybe what I'm trying to get at, you know, has, has, working in that way and working in public space like this to, to do this exhibition, has this changed, changed your perspective on your work and maybe you know, impacted the way that you might approach future projects or, or might you know, develop your practice you know, onward from here? Uh, should I go first? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> uh, thanks for that question. It's uh, very interesting when I literally felt like I'd really done big works. Uh, when I was upstate trying to carve, I felt like these are, these are sizes that I really have been aiming at. I'm aiming at uh, either eight feet, nine feet and 10 feet tall pieces. And when, when they were in my studio, they felt like I had, a, I had done a good job. But trust me, when they were installed there, they look like babies. I feel like, oh Perfect. God, I need to go bigger than this. I feel like the babies in there, and um, they're really tiny. I can't believe, but well, photos are bringing them up. If you somebody stands next to them, they're big, but if they're drawn from above, they feel like they're cups. So mm. I, I think like I need to get much bigger. <laughs> that that's what I'm thinking about. Great. Um, I, I, I yeah, guess I'll, I'll say like, um, um, I don't know, I, I feel like the what I'm actually quite des desperate for at the moment is this kind of uh, like freedom to experiment and uh, sort of like to, to limit the constraints of what it is that I want to make as much as possible. Um, and I feel like with this project, uh, working with the fabricator that I worked with was definitely probably one of the most fulfilling experiences I've had because there was so much expertise in the engineering and like, you know, like 
I just didn't, I didn't hear, I didn't hear no as much, you know, like, uh, it sort of felt like everything, every idea that I had was sort of on the table. And uh, I, I guess moving forward, I would like to feel more of that, like, you, you know, to, to have a bizarre or weird idea that might seem like it's not possible or to hear all the reasons why you can't do it, but like still work through that. Um, it's kind of what I want to continue to do. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. <laughs> Collaboration. Yeah. Hugh, Kian, do you have anything you want to add to that part of the conversation? Um, yeah, I'll add that this process was similarly like really inspiring for me um, for many reasons. Um, public, I mean, having a work made of like, having a work made of like sort of the materials that I work with outdoors helps me like understand the materials more and like what I'm trying to do with it. So um, as an example, um, when I was installing, there were like days um, where uh, there were like a few, or like a weekend or two when like there was just really intense thunderstorms. <clears throat> and the way that I, part of what I was doing um, during my install was taking the sort of, um, taking the pieces of the sculpture and then putting them together on site. And then just like, um, um, molding and modeling around the seams um, of the armature. Um, and so essentially the work was wet as in like there was like wet mud on the surface and around the work. Um, and it was just curing, you know, outdoor in the sun. And during the, um, during one of these thunderstorms, what happened was that, you know, the rain and the wind made these really interesting patinas on the surface. And then a lot of like the just residue around it, like sand, there's a beach close by and like some of the like elements in the ground around the environment got embedded into the surface of the, um, of the piece, which for me is really exciting because I do, um, I'm interested in these ideas of like transformation and how like, how, um, how objects, how people are transformed by, you know, the, the social, the environmental, the political context that we inhabit. And so to have like the sort of environment make these sort of transformations on the sculpture um, was conceptually really exciting, thinking about like land as, as, um, as a collaborator that's also kind of making a mark and imprint um, and also just having, um, having this work outdoors that's like, you know, going through these various changes. Um, so I feel like I'm going to like, this might be a series, the beginning of a series of works. That's really beautiful. That's so exciting. Hugh, cool. anything uh, else on that front? Well, you've been uh, collaborating with people for quite some time in your practice, but. Well, but not to like. Uh, I mean, I've worked with assistants, but still, it, it's there's it's always like gradations of hmm. like making the artistic decisions versus things that are like sandy or or like methodical things that are just repetitive. Um, versus on the I guess this project and another recent public art project, um, I, I I always got a kick out of that. Um, Working with fabricators, they in both cases the uh, the project ended up being harder to make than they thought, <laughs> and, and only that that gives like some validation that it it's not as like myself it's not as easy as it looks to create, um, yeah. and that, that there is like a you know because I'm using wood which is you know been around longer than man. Mm -hmm. Well, and uh, this idea that it's like per se these works could have been made in the past, but you know it, it's just sort of that they're um, they are like sort of challenging to produce. That it's not dependent on some new 
like cutting edge technology. Oh. I mean, although we will use that when it when it can save time, uh, but it, it's sort of it's not actually um, you know it's not made out of like uh, plastic or per se. In this case, no offense against like plastic, if if depending what the work is, but. Mm -hmm. Uh, <laughs> but just just that um you know like using wood in a ways that aren't not, i don't want to say conventional but they aren't the most pragmatic but you're exploring uh, or wood is an organic material but using it in these ways that or, or or even in a way more old traditional techniques of boat building aren't those sort of methods have been abandoned by like con like contemporary and global cultures and technologies. And so I kind of enjoy that um, aspects of my work, if, if anything, sometimes rely on traditional techniques that in using things that have become kind of outdated because they're, they might take too long in today's world. They, those things, those the result of those methods also like I think more with the materiality of something that that it it becomes foreign in a way that's also intimate, but also nostalgic for for this sort of connection to nature or to the materials. So it, um, I, I guess I'm you know no, I I think my ways of working kind of foster that. And and again, saying it's not a painting or it's not something on Instagram. Like I think all these works are better experienced in person, and uh, that. It's, we haven't gotten to a point with technology that can then that can truly replicate the experience of like sculpture, you know, in person in public, you know, in with the sight line of the Statue of Liberty. You're looking at Lower Manhattan, uh, and you know, something you can touch, you can climb on, you can jump in. And, you know, um, I think that that can't be replicated. And that's like one of the benefits of you know public art. Well, thank you so much. I think those are great, um, a great note to end on. Um, and I just want to say thank you so much to you all, to Keon, to Dozy, to Layla, to Hugh, to Tao, who's not here. Um, you know, I, I'm so proud of you all for the incredible work that you've contributed to this exhibition. They really are masterpieces in every one of them. Um, and I want to congratulate you. I just want to thank you again for for your generosity and for your willingness to, to work in this really challenging but incredibly impressive way. Um, and, and you've created brilliant works um, for a brilliant exhibition, you know, Black Atlantic. I encourage everyone who's in the audience, please go to Brooklyn Bridge Park and see these works in person. Um, and thank you for joining us today for this lovely talk. Thank you all.